Um, how good is it to be in church on a rainy Sunday? There's no other place you'd prefer to be, right? We are so glad that you joined us today. You make a preacher's heart smile to look out and see your beautiful faces. Why don't you grab a seat? Hey, if you're online, we're so glad you're with us too. We know that there are lots of people in our family who are sick, right? And we are praying for you, Holy Spirit. We just pray across everybody who's watching online today because they are sick. Holy Spirit, would you bring healing to their bodies? We pray for our lead pastors. Would you just cause that flu to go in the name of Jesus? Lord God, we know that you are a God of healing and we have full faith and confidence that people will be restored to full health in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, we are so glad, though, that you don't miss church. And if online is the space that you are gathering in, we are so glad that you have joined us today. We are going to have a great Sunday, hey? Come on. We've had a great couple of weeks from Vision. Who got excited about Vision? That, all right. Who got excited about Vision, people? <laughs> Come on. We have had an awesome couple of weeks and... Uh, Pastor Nate has been calling us and Pastor Rach into discipleship, and that's an exciting journey. Anything can happen in that space, right? So we are jumping into our journey in Mark even more, and, and we have been learning, in case you've forgotten, uh, Mark is like our action-packed gospel, right? It is fast-paced. I think if it was around today, we'd call it Jesus' Instagram highlight reel, Right? We are going from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle. Um, and to be honest, you know, Twitter would be blowing up. Pastor Darren was telling us all that he's got 100,000 followers on TikTok now, which is awesome. He's not here right at this moment. He's doing a, a job for me. But Jesus would have like a billion followers. Like it would be like totally blowing up right now with people videoing the amazing things that he does in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, so where we have left off is that the kingdom has been announced Jesus says, hey, the kingdom of God is near. And, uh, and he calls the disciples to follow him. And now we are jumping in, right? Mark immediately, he loves this word, immediately he launches into the action of what it actually means that the kingdom of God has come to earth. And so if you've got your Bibles, or it's also going to be up on the screen, why don't you jump to Mark? We're in chapter 1. And we are starting from verse 21 today. We're going to read to 29. Let's go, hey? So they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and he began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Is it any wonder he offended a few people, right? <laughs> And just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus says sternly, and come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. When you read the Bible, do you sometimes just like ask questions? Because it's a really good way to read scripture. We can be a bit complacent and just read this and go, oh, yeah, cool, Jesus cast a demon out. Like, this is pretty amazing. <laughs> and we should be asking questions. Hey, this was happening right in church. What did it look like? What would I have done if I'm in this situation? Like, what was going on with that man? Was this his first Sunday in church? Had he been coming along? Like, I'm asking these questions as I'm reading, which is a really good practice to get into, right, when you're reading Scripture. And so not surprisingly, verse 27 the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. And not surprisingly, news about him, right, spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. And they didn't have Instagram and emails. And, you know, this is just word of mouth. It spread like wildfire because of what Jesus was doing, right? And see, Mark is on a mission, an absolute mission to announce that Jesus has all authority and he's going to prove it in the things that he does. 
And we're going to see this unpacked in the weeks to come. You know, you kind of got to strap on in because you're going to have story after story after story of how Jesus has absolute authority over absolutely everything that we see, but even also that we don't see. And today, Pastor Nate's given me two huge ones to unpack with you. And the teacher in me is like telling me to slow down and simplify because you could preach each of these individually. Like you could preach for weeks just on the authority of Jesus' word, right? And then you could preach for weeks on his authority over everything in the demonic realm. But don't worry, I will keep to time. Well, I will try. Hey, you know, Jesus doesn't shy away from making waves in this passage. I love how he walks into a synagogue, right? On the Sabbath, he teaches with authority and totally like puts the teachers of the law to shame. And then he exercises a demon. And as I was wrestling in this one, I, I wrestled and wrestled. And I felt a little bit like I did when I got the speaking in tongues one like a couple of sermons ago, I'm kind of wondering what I'm going to get next, (laughs) because it's curly. It's a really curly topic, and sometimes teaching on things like this, particularly in the demonic realm, and if we're going into spiritual warfare, sometimes teaching can do more harm than good. And what is it that the Holy Spirit wants to say to us right now in this moment, right? We could go into an entire teaching series on the freedom in, like freedom in Christ. And I've been there this week. Trust me. You should see the slashing floor. Pastor Rach walked into my office on Thursday and she's like, how much paper do you have? And I'm like, this is what it looks like to refine down right to a 25-minute message. And so I want to encourage you. There is so much more than what I'm going to say today. But sometimes the Holy Spirit just has to have a place to start. And so I'm believing that the Holy Spirit is just starting us from a place today, at which point he says, go out from here and explore and walk with me and find the freedom that he wants to bring in certain areas of our life. So can I encourage you to do that after today, right? Because this concept of the sovereign authority of Jesus, huge concept, it has huge ramifications for you and I as believers, like it changes everything on us, for us, in us, through us. And it should be this bedrock of our identity. Like we should walk each and every day in the full confidence of who we are in Christ. Jesus has all authority, right? And he died for us, which brought us out of sin and back into relationship with God. That is the beautiful salvation story. But sometimes we just stop there. See, that wasn't all that Jesus did at salvation. He did so much more because through faith in him, we now move into his kingdom. Like we are out of authority over here that we were stuck in in the world and under Satan. And we actually positionally move to this space where we are now standing in the kingdom of God as sons and daughters. And the Bible even goes far, so far to say, right, Romans eight seventeen, that we are now co-heirs with Christ. Like that's a huge, huge thing to try and understand the full ramifications of what that means. And so we now live in the same authority as Jesus, right? We get to continue his mission in bringing the kingdom. So when we read a scripture like this today and we read what Jesus did, the the application to us is now that's what we do. But we can't do that if we don't have this full revelation and this freedom that enables us to walk in this identity as co-heirs with Christ. And that's what I feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to start in a place today. This call to discipleship is this call back to who we are in Christ and beginning to walk that out in our lives. And so I'm believing that the Holy Spirit's going to speak revelation to us today about what's our next step in walking in that. So you with me? Yeah? Yeah? You got to get a bit vocal today. Like it's cold up here. I think you have to move around, shout, you can raise your hands, you can give some encouragement, 
uh, because we are talking about some awesome, awesome things. So number one, the first thing at the beginning of this scripture is that Jesus is absolute truth. He has all authority in word, right? When Jesus walks into the synagogue, we need to remember that he's not actually preaching to people who have no idea. He is preaching to people who know the story, the full story of history, the real story of history. They know about the creation of the world. They know about the problem of sin. They know about the problem of being stuck under the authority of Satan. They know about the redemptive thread that Jesus or God has been promising throughout Scripture. And he's promised them this Messiah King who would come and rescue them from it once and for all. They know all of this, right? And they have listened to the truth week in and week out from the experts of the law. Or so they thought, right? Yet when Jesus walks in and he speaks to them, his word carries an authority and a truth like nothing they have heard before. That's what this scripture is telling us. Mark uses such a strong verb here. It's like, you know, it's, it's astounded. It's marveled. Some actually say they were disturbed in their souls. See, Jesus didn't come like the visiting teachers because that was a common practice. They'd invite teachers to come in and, and preach or read scripture. But Jesus didn't come like them with another opinion for consideration. Right? And he didn't cite other laws or traditions or scholars as proof for what he was saying. That's what the teachers of the law would often do. But when Jesus spoke, he just spoke as I am. I am telling you the truth because I wrote this truth. Like, it is me. The authority that this truth carried was just was because it just was. Because he is truth, standing there, right there, telling him. And in you, in humanity, our spirits, it was created by God. So it recognizes, right, the truth when it hears it. When the blinders come off, our spirit connects with that truth. And Mark, right here at the beginning of the passage, is claiming that Jesus is the divine king, not just a king, the divine king, of the divine kingdom that he has just claimed has come, right? And so when he speaks, his word comes with an authority outside of human wisdom and it compels in them a response. When I was preparing this, I felt the Holy Spirit just gently reminding me, hey, every time we approach this word, do we do so with that same reverence of the authority that it carries? Or do we just flick through it quickly, get through that Bible reading plan on our phone or or flick through some nice scriptures while we're eating brekkie before we run out in the morning? Because see, the Bible tells us that this is God-breathed. And the words of Jesus that are in here carry the exact same authority that these people heard in that moment that compelled them, right, to make a decision. And we have been talking about as a church, you know, that we're being called back to discipleship. Well, the truth is this word has got to be a foundational element of where we start in that. I love that we're talking about table spaces, right? And we want to have really good God conversations around table spaces. Can I tell you that we can't have good God conversations if they're just based on our opinions or our thoughts or our concepts of who God is. They're awesome God conversations when they're based on the revelations of the authority of this word. And no amount of intellectual study places us in a position, right, where we can bend this word to fit our culture or to fit what we'd like to believe or to prove our point on Facebook. Please don't do that. Jesus, he's the one with the absolute truth, right? He is the one with all authority and word. And the beautiful thing about that is that when we allow him, right? When we allow him to shape us with his word, we actually walk into life. Like he's not doing this. He's not giving us rules in here that kill all our fun. Sometimes I think we look at, we look at this and we see it like a rule book. It's not a rule book. 
It's like words of love. It's words of life. And when we allow them to shape us, what happens is our spirit, like, and our body and our souls, we're transformed and we realize, we're like, oh, that's awesome. Like, now I'm free to live in this truth. And it changes our life for the better and and we get hungry for it. If you're not hungry for the Word of God, if you're not hungry for it to change your life, then can I encourage you, take some time with the Holy Spirit and ask Him to begin to speak to you through the Word And then take the time to sit in it, not with your own preconceived ideas. Just come with a a blank mind, right, that allows the Holy Spirit to actually write and speak into you. Our first take home from this message today is that Jesus has all authority in word, right? But we have to submit to it. But that's where we find freedom, right? Submission is not a bad thing. Submission is an awesome thing because Jesus is the creator of the whole world. He knows how you work. So can I encourage you to do that today? It is still very quiet in here. Let's hear some amens. Online, I know you are shouting. Fire emojis, love it. Thank you. All right, let's jump into the second space, right? Verse 23. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I really wonder how that came out. Like, did it come out like a fighting words? Did it come out like a shriek? Oh my goodness. What we have here in Scripture is the very first Jesus versus the demonic showdown, right? And in our rationalistic, science-based world, we become so complacent that there are two realities at play around us all the time. This is not something that happened back in Jesus' day. There is a Jesus and a demonic showdown happening each and every day in and through our lives, in our communities, right? I'm going to get back to my notes because I'm jumping ahead. And immediately, Mark says, though, in this showdown, right, immediately, They are confronted with this authority and teaching and immediately this demonic spirit cries out. Why? Like, why do you think? You can answer. No idea. That's right. Thank you, Brad. I love it. He knew who Jesus was, right? Jesus had entered the room. The king has entered the room. And when the king enters the room, this demonic realm, who has by dirty play stolen the authority over God's precious creation, right? That's how he got it in the first place. He didn't play fair. But when Jesus walks into the room, the demonic is greatly disturbed. Why? Because its entire existence is threatened by the authority of Jesus, right? The second clear space of authority is that Jesus has all authority over the entire demonic realm, over the entire spiritual realm, over everything that we can't see. But I tell you what, if you read this word... There is a battle going on. Like I kind of, I have this new appreciation for um, our gospel writers and for Paul because I understand why they, they write so passionately and they're imploring their listeners to flee from sin and to follow God and to be devoted to him. And the reason they're doing that is because they see this battle that's going on, right? And they want them to know who they are in Christ so that they don't get taken out in the journey, right? There are two kingdoms pitted against each other. But as we hear about that, the really important thing to do is to know that it is not an even fight, right? If you'd paid money, right, to go to a boxing match and there's like that one punch knockout in the the first 30 seconds, you'd probably feel a little bit ripped off, right? Well, the good news is that's exactly how it is when King Jesus comes up against the demonic realm, then, like back here, and right now, right now, whatever you're facing, you're facing something, Jesus wins in the first 30 seconds, right? There is actually no fight. 
And this story here is so significant. Jesus says, be quiet, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently, came out of him with a shriek. Right? This story is so significant because it is the first space that we see Jesus initiating God's judgment over Satan and all his demonic realm. And we are going to hear, whew, settle down now. We are going to hear story after story after story from near here on out. And every one of them is a defeat of Satan. When he heals someone, he's defeating Satan. Do you know why? Because he is restoring his creation. He's saying, no, you're not meant to be blind. See, no, you're not meant to be possessed by that spirit. Be free. No, you're meant to walk, walk. They're all the things that the enemy had stolen from humanity. You were never meant to be bound up. You were never meant to have depression. You were never meant to have any infirmity in this life. And when King Jesus enters the room, that stuff has to go, right? Pastor Simo read my scripture earlier. God must be up to something, hey? Colossians 2.15, having disarmed the powers and authority. That's what he's doing right now. He's disarming the powers and authorities. He makes a complete public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It's totally finished. Satan and his demons have absolutely no authority over you as a believer because you are under that finished work by Jesus on the cross, right? And we now, if we, once we get to Mark 16, he tells us that we now are going to drive the demons out in his name. We get to tell them to be quiet, right? When we operate in the authority of Jesus, we get to tell them to be quiet, and salvation gives us this entire new authority to walk in. You know, we're going to do communion when we get to the end of this message, which is why the ushers are handing that out. And if you're online today, why don't you, if you haven't got something for communion, why don't you grab some bread and some juice so that you can participate with us as well. But we're going to have a time of communion because that is the significant authority, victory, winning moment of Jesus over everything in the demonic realm, right? Right? And church, do you know why this is so important? It's because we are needed, right? You are set free because God wants you to be free. Absolutely, that's his plan. But also because we live in this world that is now and not yet. So you might be saying to me, oh, okay, Mel, well, if it's all over, why is there stuff still out there? Why is there oppression? Why do we see the demonic realm sometimes? Why do we get bound up? Why can't I walk in freedom? Why doesn't this thing just go like I'm telling it to go? We live in this now but not yet world, right? Yep. And Jesus has absolutely won the victory, but there's a battle going on. And so you and I are needed as sons and daughters of God. You know, I was listening to a thing about Bonhoeffer the other day. And do you know that he was actually martyred after the Nazis had lost the war. The Nazis didn't just stop fighting because they lost to the Allies. They actually committed some of their worst atrocities after they'd lost the war. That's what Satan's like. He's out there trying to create havoc even though he's lost the war and he needs the sons and daughters. Well, God has called us as the sons and daughters to bring that final victory, like to, to kick him out. We've got to kick him out of spaces. We've got to see the kingdom advanced until Jesus comes at the end and brings the final victory, at which point he is bound forevermore, right? The demonic is meant to come up against us, and we are not afraid to get in this battle, peoples. I tell you, I have stood, I can be honest, stood in the presence of the demonic, and I have no fear because of he who is in me, so much greater Satan makes himself sound loud, but he is not. God is so much greater. And you know, one of the saddest things I ever heard a friend say to me once was they didn't want to grow too much in Jesus or they didn't want to do too much for him because they didn't want to attract the attention of the devil. And if they just flew under the radar, then he'd leave them alone. People's. 
you're in the battle because you're a human. You can't like avoid him. And then you're in the battle because you became a believer. But that was the best decision you ever made because you moved into a place of victory. So we don't need to be afraid of the enemy. And this is what I felt like the Holy Spirit was just laying on my heart today is that one of the greatest ways Satan stops us is just by stopping us walking in our true identity, right? He just keeps us bound up in things. Sometimes he keeps us bound up in shame or fear or insecurity or sin or idolatry. Or sometimes he just completely distracts us and keeps us so busy that we're not even looking at the reality that we live in, right? We're not even on the playing field. And so by default, we don't recognize his schemes because we are playing right into them. And he does this. Do you know why he does this? Because you are such a threat to him. If you can't take anything away from this, is that in Jesus, you are a threat to the devil. Your authority in Jesus threatens his very existence. And Satan cannot pull you out of the kingdom of God cannot pull you out of there but he can absolutely entice you to open doors into your soul that allow him to set up camps in there and keep you from being who God created you to be that's his scheme one of them that's the one we're going to look at today I want to tell you a story of some mice we did some renos last year and we pulled out a kitchen and we knocked down some walls And one night I was sitting in my lounge room and I just heard this, you know, and I ignored it. Maybe a couple of nights later, I heard it again, scurry, 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 scurry through the walls and I ignored it. And then maybe a little while after that, I didn't just hear a scurry, scurry, like it was an entire three generations of something running through my roof and my walls. And you know, we put a trap out and we catch this little furry brown thing Oh, okay, we'll put a couple more traps out. Like we are catching six mice a night at the bottom. And I look around my house and I realise there's this gaping big hole where my kitchen cupboard sink used to be that goes straight outside. Like the brickwork, but there's a hole into the brickwork. Like, and I realise that I have let a mouse into my house and then I have let this mouse breed. Maybe I'll let a couple in to the point that now my house is overrun by mouse and I have to absolutely do something about it, right? So you get the exterminator. And uh, he comes and he sets some awesome traps. They didn't go straight away. And we plugged up the hole. That was kind of important, right? But eventually those mice were gone. And I'm really diligent now about not having holes in my walls that lead to the outside. I tell you this story because I want you to have a picture, right? Because I think the Holy Spirit wants to kick some mice out today. You might only have one mice, mouse. You might have three generations of mice and they might've been there for a long time. And you know what? That mouse might've looked super cute and cuddly when he first came in. But now he's super captive, right? You're captive by it. Because Satan gets in all kinds of different holes. Maybe you have an unresolved hurt, right? And Satan just pushed those buttons of how unfair it was until you don't even know how you got there, but you've got that unresolved anger and unforgiveness. Or maybe it was that sin that looked like, you know, a cute little mouse. It looked fun. It looked harmless. It appealed to your pride or our pleasure, right? But now we're totally captive by it. Or maybe we just became so busy with our lives and we put other things before God and we are kind of complacent that we don't even see it as idolatry. We don't talk about that word anymore, but we become okay with putting other things up there that are more important than God. Maybe there's stuff that came in from before we were Christians. Maybe we've had stuff to do with witchcraft. Maybe tarot cards looked harmless. Young people, they are not harmless. Angel guides, I got so grieved in my spirit because I saw someone on a Facebook, an acquaintance making crystal wands and angel guides. Looks lovely. It's not. And eventually the spirit that's behind there 
will show its true colours. And then you've got generations of mice in your house. But James 4, 7 tells us that when we submit to God and resist the devil, he releases us, right? The devil has to flee. When you submit to God and resist Him, He has to flee. So we get to say right now, today, it starts, be quiet, get out. Right? And then we plug up the hole. Plug it up real good. Right? And we ask the Holy Spirit to empower us because sometimes there's generations of mice that we have to kick out. Okay? Sometimes it comes in a moment. Sometimes it's a process but you will win because Jesus is with you. And then fill up the space, church. Don't just leave an empty space there. That's where we get urgent, right? We pray, we worship, we join a table space. We're in church every week. We hang out with people who know and love God. We fill up the space that was there with stuff we don't want, with the stuff that we do want. We're gonna have a time of communion, church. Because I fully believe that the Holy Spirit has been talking to each and every one of us. We're all in different spaces on a freedom journey. But if you are walking with Jesus in transformation, there is always a space that He wants to set you free from. And so I'm believing that as I've been talking today, the Holy Spirit is jumping on that. Hey, you could be free. Or He might even be highlighting something that you haven't even seen before could be something that you thought was harmless, but the Holy Spirit is just putting His gentle finger on it today in loving kindness and saying, hey, that's not of me. Hey, I want you just to change that. Hey, would you come back to me in this space? Hey, would you put me first here? Whatever it is, I believe the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you.